Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I'm Will. I'm joined by my co-host, Legrees, and this is another podcast drinking with we haven't episode. done it in a minute we haven't we've you know had a lot going on with whiskey week and everything but we're yeah. we're glad to have a guest tonight that is uh, a bourbon and whiskey legend a borderline hero so when you think of of whiskey names are very important you know you you know names of distillers you know like stag or like uh, let's see uh, Le- william larue weller Maybe more modern, you think of Russell or you think of uh, No. Those are Beam. Those are all yeah. names that are are familiar with people. This is a name Her- I am Heritage Man. I am I am very certain will go down in the history books of Bourbon because of the uh, great uh, contributions to the spirit. And we're going to talk about and, that tonight. And I got my hair cut for him. You did. So we're going to bring on our guest now this is greg metz of old elk distillery greg welcome to drinking with the podcast hey guys thrilled to be here been looking forward to this for a long time Uh, greg you and i have a history on youtube yes we do yeah it's been we were we were on a game show together (laughs) and and I I definitely beat Greg. There was like Save by the Bell pop culture questions. So it was your wheel. He was yeah. Oh, <laughs> dude, it was it was the competition was built for me. But you know, Greg during that time in in his life, you know, he's making some of the best whiskey ever, and so he ain't got no time for Save by the Bell. That's fair. He probably didn't even know it existed. No, but we have to go on record. You you kicked my freaking ass, man. <laughs> <laughs> Grease well, is uh, he's I was actually, like, AC Slater. Grease is actually very good at online contest, so that's, that's kind oh, of his yeah. forte. Some would say it's rigged, Greg. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. It was a great outing. It was a lot of fun, and uh, absolutely, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, it, was it was. It was really stuff. fun, man. Those were some weird times, man, where uh, everything was remote and you and you didn't want to do another Zoom meeting or an interview like we're doing right now, but. You were like, what else, what else can we do? Like, oh, let's just do a game night, which was, yeah. I mean, during that fun. time, that was an amazing idea. That was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And yep. I, you know, it gave us a chance to, to get with the audience, get with the consumers. And, uh, you know, COVID was tough. It's like a two-year gap in life. Uh, right. Yeah. It was, it was tough. And I think, like, Wait, that's been almost two years now. Right. Since y'all did yeah. that. And, and like you're saying, it's a two-year gap. It, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. It doesn't. It's crazy. I, I feel like I haven't let, let lived in this house for long. Probably about two years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's typically every two years. <laughs> so, Greg, uh, I w- in the intro, I was saying how I, I think that you've made such uh, an important contribution to the spirit. And the I, I'm curious about your um, how you got into the whiskey industry because you have been in it for four decades now. Yeah, I'm actually starting my, I'll be in June, I'll start my 45th year. Which is fantastic and yeah. phenomenal, but you spent the majority of that time at a that is very, older than us. very small operation in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, known as the Seagram's Distillery, or yeah. as every whiskey nerd knows now, MGP Ingredients. Yeah. Uh, how did you get started at Seagram's? Uh, fact of the matter is, uh, and this, this might be disappointing for the uh, audience, but, uh, frankly, it was pure dumb luck. Uh, uh, way back in 1978, uh, I was graduating from the university of Cincinnati and, uh, with a chemical engineering degree. And uh, back then companies actually came to campus to recruit for open positions that they had at their facilities. And, uh, as it was. Uh, Seagram's uh, came to campus uh, and uh, were interviewing, uh, you know, uh, soon to be graduates uh, looking for folks that could fill positions that they had open at the plant. And uh, so I went through that process, uh, was fortunate enough to have been offered a job. And really beyond that, uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, the only thing I knew for sure. Uh, at that point was I was 23 and I was going to go work for a company and made whiskey. And I thought, that's really pretty, very, that's, that's very cool. 
Yeah. Uh, How does it feel, uh, Greg, to be recruited by someone? Because Grease well, has never been recruited. I've we, never, is what he's trying to. Yeah. I mean, you went into a recruitment office one time for the Marines, but they took one look at you and said, no, sir. Mm, no, what no chemical person. engineer school are we going to this week? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that may just be a generational thing. I'm not sure, but. Uh, no, I'm pretty uh, sure. I mean, people but, get recruited nowadays. Just well, not the well, LinkedIn, LinkedIn does. It. <laughs> Makes it super easy to do that. Except you don't do that on um for football. You don't do that. You don't recruit that way. You got to go to their house yeah. anyway. Greg, I'm sorry. That was a that was a you know a quick exit to the right. Um. So, but you you not only started there right out of college, but you spent decades there rising all the way to the position of master distiller yes sir and and one thing that is remarkable to me is that um some of the most favorite bourbons i've ever had um were runs of 10 to 12 year old single barrels uh from you know 2016 to 2020 and they were a lot of non-distiller producers that were sourcing right. MGP, Indiana bourbon. So some of my favorite bourbons I've ever had were bourbons that were made under your leadership as master distiller. And that's why I, in the and intro. not only that, Christmas bourbon palooza. Right. It beat out 18 or 17 other bottles blind. And we're talking... William LaRue Weller, Pappy, we're talking uh, old Stitzel. And like it was blind, and then we everybody voted and ended up being a store pick, a single barrel selection of, of a Bell Mead 10 year MGP product. And it just, it just sung like a daggum bird in the spring. But that has got to be a different feeling. Now, we, we won't dwell on this too much because we're going to get to Old Elk. But sure. uh, the, the difference in you were creating a, a, with uh, obviously a very good team around you. It's not one person making the whiskey, but you were the master distiller of a company that was making whiskey that wasn't really putting their name or your name on it. It was just produced to be sent out uh, for others to lay, put under their label. How how is that experience as as someone who's you know whiskey is an art and a science um, when your entire product base isn't really getting the recognition especially at that time for who's making it? Well, it, it was uh, you know the recognition part. Uh, I will tell you true uh, over the last ten or twelve years has been fun, but uh, it's it's really never been. Uh, a big part of my makeup. Uh, frankly speaking, I'm, I'm a, a, a person that likes to accomplish something every day. Uh, and it could be as simple as something as just cleaning up a, a, a really cluttered up dirty garage on, on a Saturday. And you start with something that's just a total mess. And, and at the end of the day, you have it all organized and clean and that, you know, you can stand back at the end of that day and say, man, I, you know, I accomplished something. This garage looks great. And I take, uh, you know, I take great gratification out of that. And uh, frankly speaking, all those years when we were uh, contract distilling for many, many brands, uh, the gratification for me actually came at the end of every day, leaving that facility, knowing that we were producing world-class spirits for some brand out there. And, uh, you know, I will tell you true that the, the recognition, uh, recently has been a lot of fun, but, uh, it, it's not, a, a necessary part of my makeup. Uh, and I just took great gratification out of knowing that, that we were producing world-class quality spirits for a lot of different folks out there. And the honest to God's truth is that all that was, uh, uh, came to fruition uh, literally because of the training that I received from the Seagram company for the 24 years that uh, I was uh, working under their umbrella. They had, and that's the part I didn't know when I joined the company, was that I was going to get the best training in the world relative to becoming a master distiller. 
and and their training program was such that it, it wasn't a a time framed base training program it lasted for as long as you worked for the signal company and for me it lasted 24 years uh, and and everything that i've done uh, beyond that 24 year period has really carried over and and, and i've taken everything that i learned uh, from them folks to move forward and do uh, new and exciting things especially with old elk but uh, really, it's it's all it's all based on that foundation, if you will. And, well, and that it seems like when when you're at a company that obviously is reinvesting in the employees, wanting them to grow as a worker, it it shows when they're able to produce such remarkable things that they are paying attention to the quality of the product, but also the quality of the people that they have uh, at, working there. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so when you started working on the old elk project, you were still master distiller at at uh, Seagram's, correct? Uh, well, yes, I was at the Lawrenceburg uh, Distillery. Uh, I think when I first met old elk, I was we were still under uh, LDI. I think that would have been like 2011 ish, uh, and then uh, 2012 or late 2012 is when. Uh, you know, the, the next transition occurred, uh, LDI, uh, uh, sold the MGP in, in like at the very end of 2012. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I actually met old elk, uh, as a, uh, a, you know, a, a customer, a client, uh, and they came, they came to me, uh, saying that they, uh, were very interested in getting into the bourbon business. Uh, but and, and wanted me to to craft and produce custom mash bills for them rather than the, the five or so uh, other mash bills that we produced throughout my whole career uh, under many different brand names. Uh, they were all world class quality whiskeys that were all staple Seagram mash bills. But uh, when I met Old Elk in 2011, 2012, uh, they wanted custom mash bills. And the truth be known is that was the first opportunity for me. And at that point, I was about 35 years into my career to actually have the latitude of building a mash bill uh, from the ground up unrestricted relative to cost. And uh, the very first mash bill that they asked me to produce was the old up flagship bourbon mash bill. And they gave me two words to work with for that one. They said, Greg, we want our product to be smooth and easy. That was it. That was the end of the meeting. So, you know, I'm 35 years into a career. I've never built a, a, a mash bill from the ground up. Uh, I knew how to produce world-class whiskeys, obviously, and, and I was taught that through the Seagram uh, company. But So it was, uh, it was uh, you know, like, like a painter being uh, handed a palette and say, here, you can do whatever you want. Uh, don't worry about cost. Uh, just give us a product that's going to be smooth and easy. And I thought, man, this is fabulous. So, uh, you know, at that point, I really just leveraged uh, my experience to uh, come up with the mash bill and uh, to hit smooth and easy. I, I knew uh, that I had to get the malted barley content way up in the mash bill. Uh, but also in the back of my mind, I, I also knew that uh, all the mash bills that I produced uh, up to that point in my career always had some degree of rye in it for a, a nice little spice characteristic. And, and uh, again, through experience, I knew that to get that characteristic to follow through into the distillate, it takes a minimum of 15% rye in the mash bill. So, uh, you know, once I arrived at that point, it really became. Uh, should I write that down? I feel like I should write that down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just feel like that's an inside, like, yeah, I mean, you know, I've in 45 years, this is what I've come up with. So, um, well, you're coming up on your 45th year, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, um, the, the other component though, that's fascinating to me is I feel like when, so we're, we're currently drinking the, uh, the weeded bourbon, okay. uh, the yeah. 92 proof. And I feel like for a lot of us, when we think of a non-cast strength bourbon, one that's been proofed down, um, 
In our heads, we think that you just take the whiskey and you just dump the water in and then you ship it out in the bottling line. But it's more complicated than that. But especially at Old Elk, you have a very specific way of proofing down the whiskey. Yeah, there's that's no completely rules. different. <laughs> there's literally no rules at Old Elk. So tell us about the proofing process because okay. this fascinates yeah. me. No, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the really, there's two things about Old Elk's DNA. And first and foremost, it's bringing world class quality products to the table. So anything. Uh, that's got Old Elk's name on it. It's going to be as good or better than uh, anybody else on the market. And then the second part of our DNA is to be different than everybody else in the market. So our mash bills, at least three of our four core category mash bills reflect that. And then also the proofing, the slow cut proofing process that you allude to uh, sets us apart from others in the industry. And, and, uh, Really what that is, is we learned that process from Nancy Fraley. Uh, we didn't invent it. It's, 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 it's not ours. We, we learned about it from Nancy Fraley in, in one of her uh, uh, talks or whatever. Uh, but we did adopt our own version of it. Uh, but it, at the end of the day, what the slow cut proofing process does is it, if, if you cut from barrel proof to bottling proof, uh, most people in the industry do it in one or two days. And what happens when you, when you reduce proof from high proof to low proof, you're actually changing from a high energy state to a lower energy state chemically. And when you do that, uh, you have to either release uh, a gas or you have to release heat or you have to, re you know, you, you, it's, it's an actual reaction. So, in the case of whiskey, you liberate heat into your product. Mm. And if you do it all in one step, you're releasing all that heat of reaction, which is what it's technically called. You're releasing all that heat into the product all at once. And what that does is that, uh, you know, in your product, you primarily have ethyl alcohol, but all of the other flavor components that are in there are, uh, 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 a variety of all different uh, organic solvents, if you will. And uh, some of them have lower boiling points than ethanol. Some of them have higher boiling points than ethanol. But what happens is when you induce that heat into your liquid and it's subtle, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a, you know, a gigantic heat rise, but if, if you do it in a glass, you can, you can feel it in your hand. You can feel the glass will warm up. And what happens is that uh, the heat, when you put that in there like that, is actually enough to drive away some of the really delicate congeners that you work so hard to produce through your mash bills and fermentation, uh, primarily uh, acid aldehyde, ethyl acetates, and components like that that have a much lower boiling point than ethyl alcohol by itself. So uh, by doing it in several stages or multiple stages, uh, incrementally, you're putting in much smaller amounts of heat into the product at a given time. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're using the same amount of water from start to finish that everybody uses. But by doing it in, in many, many steps, the amount of heat that goes into the product at any given point is, is much, much smaller, which allows you to actually preserve some of those really delicate low boiling congeners. Uh, uh, the best analogy I can give you, and it's really kind of a woodworking term, uh, it, it's a subtle difference. It's, it's not, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not like a step change. And if you look at slow cut, fast cut, it's not a gigantic step change change, but it, it's a subtle. And uh, again, the best analogy I can give you is if you had a, a real nice tabletop on a piece of furniture that had a, a square edge, and then you uh, routed that edge round with a router. That's essentially what the slow cut process does. It just adds a little bit more balance, a little bit, bit more integrity, and it kind of smooths uh, some of the rough or harsh edges. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's it, like clear ice versus fridge ice. Yeah, uh, on the rocks. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's what that's, I'm taking. And I also realize that Greg's really smart, and I think he's too smart for me. 
That's oh, no. that's a that's a common theme in your life. Well, though. there was like I don't know. There was five words in that at least that I've never heard in my life. Michael cracked an old elk bourbon store pick to enjoy during this stream. Thanks for watching, Michael. And if you guys have any questions as well, uh, go ahead and ask him. Like we have yeah, one here from Dunny that says, "How long does the slow cut process take?" Well, in, in our case, uh, we stretch it out over uh, probably uh, five to six different steps. So, so we'll cut. We'll cut. Uh, uh, over five or six steps, and then we'll let the product rest for maybe overnight, and then uh, we'll add more water to the next day, let it rest, add more water the next day, let it rest. So depending on what your ultimate uh, bottling proof is, sort of dictates, you know, like like the 88 proof takes another step or two than, than it does at 92 proof or 100 proof or 105, the 105.9 at the double or the four grain is or 107.1 the Double weed is. But. How long does the proofing process normally last? Because you're talking about five, like five days, right then. Yeah, right I'd there. say, in generally speaking, probably a week. Uh, okay. Plus so, or minus. I mean, and again, it's seven depends. times longer than a normal. It depends proofing. on the final proof, but right. that, generally speaking, most folks in the industry will will do their cut in one step, maybe yeah. two steps. So. Well, and I'm, yeah, I mean with the whiskey demand right now, I mean, you know, some of those big producer contract distillers and stuff like that, I don't think they could, a lot of these don't have the time, I guess, to, to push this liquid out for a week instead no, of just proofing it and get it to bottling and get it distri distributed because of just so much, you know, product lack of product, I guess, across the nation. But, no, that, and that would be absolutely true, but it, it's either that, it's either you take the tank capacity that you have on hand and you have to maximize it, or you add extra tanks so that you can slow cut the process. So it, it, it either takes, you either have to use what you have available and and do whatever you can if, if you mm -hmm. so choose to do slow cut or, uh, in, you know, really in our gotcha. case, we have... So that, that was just have, that was a substantial cost increase for old elk essentially to do it that way. Well, Cause it cost, sounds like y'all added extra tanks so that y'all could do that process that way and cost, not slow down. Yeah. Cost and time. Uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we do have the latitude given, uh, where we are in our growth, uh, that we do have the latitude of maybe extra time that some of the bigger commercial folks don't have, but, uh, you know, going forward, uh, we're, we're going to maintain uh, that slow cut process. So eventually we will have to add extra tanks uh, to continue to do that method uh, right. for the for the consumer. Yeah, I mean, OK, so <laughs> old elk products, I've seen so many different ones. I, like I said earlier, it's like old elk doesn't have any rules like. Oh, you want to do that? Let's do that. Um, which I love it because when you you moved over from MGP, you know, you were just like, man, I get to be creative. You know, I get to do other mash bills. Um, you know, and and that was awesome. Is there is there is there a mash bill that you've come across? You know, in this whole creative process, you're, that you're like, N I'm not doing that again. You know, I know that you were talking about. You know it in order to get the rice spice to mature in there, you're going to need at least 15%. Like, have you done, you know, 8% and it's turned out terribly? Or like, is there anything like that that you've tried during this whole creative process with whiskey that you've done at Old Elk? I haven't run into that uh, with anything that I've done uh, with Old Elk. Uh, you know, there are mash bills, that, uh, some experimental mash bills that I did uh, in Lawrenceburg that, uh, I will say did not pan out at least to the level that, that I would want them to. And I uh, would probably choose never to do them again, but uh, literally with old elk, it's, it's been a really a hundred percent successful track record. Um, yeah. I and, just, so um, the, the other person that came to mind um, was uh, <laughs> it, the master still at Buffalo trace Harlan, Harlan Wheatley. Um, and he, you know, he, um, 
crap. Now I've now I've lost my. Train. Well, you think about your train of thought, but I've got a question. Oh, the creativity from he put he did Amaranth in you know E H Taylor experimental project and and was aging that up and and I'm like, I mean, like, what if that was just terrible? You know, I mean, I know he's tasting it along the way. And I guess as master distillers, you guys could choose to pull that product because you feel like it's turning the other way. So you never really, you know, get to the point of, you know, you know, I wanted that to be nine years and we had to pull it at three because it was just turning so quick. Yeah. Anything yeah, that that's just kind of what I was thinking about with Harlan and the creativity, because I mean, like, I mean, with those random grains that I've never heard of anybody else doing, I was like, I feel like there's a risk. <laughs> A pretty big well, one. And, and, and then here's maybe a twist on that line of thought, if you will. I mean, as master distillers, I would say in, in some cases, maybe many cases, maybe maybe the master distiller knows too much. Mm. Uh, and and if, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter what the master distiller thinks. It's, it's what the consumer thinks. So, right. Yeah. You know, a, a, a product that that doesn't uh, necessarily line up with my uh, taste and mentality doesn't mean that it's a uh, doesn't doesn't mean that it's a bad product. And you know, it, uh, whiskey and food are very similar. And you know, what I like and what the consumer likes, uh, what I like doesn't really matter because we're in the business to satisfy a consumer. And uh, so it's our job to bring. Uh, products to market that the consumer is going to like <clears throat> now for myself personally, the only thing that I can guarantee up front and every day is that the quality of our products are going to be world-class. I, I can absolutely tell you and stand behind the fact that uh, old up products are world-class quality. I cannot say that you're going to like them. Our mash bills are uh, entirely different than everybody else's on the shelf. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, again, from a quality perspective, uh, they're as good or better than anybody else's out there. And at that point, it's really up to the consumer to decide if, if they like uh, what we're doing. And if they don't, then Old Elk is going to have to shift gears and, and uh, you know, into doing something that the consumer does appeal to. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, we uh, have never even come close to that uh, troubling possibility. So uh, right now. Yeah, I was going to say anybody that doesn't like this weeded bourbon's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that I did have that question for you because you and then we do have a, a listener question I want to ask of you. But first, you said it do, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you like. But I am curious of someone who has such a, a long and, and, and storied career at this point in bourbon. What is your favorite? Well, you know what? Uh, that's a that's probably one of the most common questions that, that uh, people ask me, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's somewhat s similar to saying, uh, you know, who's your favorite child? Uh, right. I mean, I, but you always have one. Like you're well, not supposed to say. Well, it, here's but the one. Well, one. here's the one. There's the one I've seen like a meme. There's the yeah. one you let sleep in longer. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. It's a, I'm not saying I have a favorite child, but there is one that I don't that I try not to wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it. <laughs> No, I, I, and this is the, it's going to sound like uh, the phoniest answer in the world, but the, the fact of the matter is that, that uh, Old Elk and I have uh, uh, created uh, four extremely unique mash bills in, in what I consider the four different categories of whiskeys in America. So we've got uh, Old Elk Bourbon, which is a high malted barley content mash bill, higher, way higher than anything else on the shelf. Uh, we moved on to a weeded bourbon mash bill that's 45% wheat, 51% uh, corn, the, the minimum corn and literally the maximum amount of wheat that you can get in a weeded bourbon mash bill and still have malt. Uh, we moved to a 95% wheat, 5% malt wheat whiskey. And then we've got the 95% rye, 5% malt. That's not a custom mash bill, but it's obviously one that we made famous mm. uh, in Lawrenceburg, in Indiana. And it's right. uh, always been one of my favorites, uh, uh, mainly because it's so difficult to produce. It's a, a really hard mash bill to produce and have the quality uh, come out the way uh, you would expect it to. But So from that standpoint, I mean, I, I am very proud of uh, all of, 
all four of the products that we have in those four categories. And for me, uh, it just depends on uh, sort of the day or the week or the mood that I'm in relative to which one I might drink at the end of the day. Uh, so I, I, I honest to God, do not have a favorite. Well, I'll let it stand this time, but that was a good answer because I like the uh, the the information we got on the Mashvilles. But this is from Chris Cox, who's asking what makes uh, and I think you kind of just answered it a little bit. But what makes Old Elk's wheater recipe so good? Does it differ much from other common wheat whiskeys or weeded bourbons rather uh, like Weller or Arsene? Well, really, the difference is is the uh, the amount of wheat in the mash bill. I, I would say that the uh, the products that he mentioned are probably in the neighborhood of twenty five to maybe twenty eight percent wheat, and uh, our mash bills are either at least in the bourbon is forty five percent wheat. So, I we elected to take when we decided that we were going to get into the wheat bourbon and wheat whiskey categories. Uh, and with Old Elk's DNA, we were going to go to the extreme. So we took it to the far end of the spectrum relative to the wheat content in those mash bills. So uh, more than anything, that that's what uh, separates us from the rest of the pack. So, so the well, biggest, <laughs> oh yeah, no. So the biggest thing that I got off this bottle when we it, this was a fresh crack, right? You yeah. brought it from your house, and fresh crack pour. It was soft as could be. Yeah, <laughs> like just delicate uh -huh. with a flavor like it it's sweet obviously but i was just so surprised I almost get, like some like tropical coconut to it too like there's yeah. just yeah and i'm just wondering if like it's the, flavor going the wheat you know like the wheat i mean dixon dudman's always said don't look at it as, as as wheat being sweet look at it as like the absence of rye and so that's what i've always you know and so it it's just i don't know it's just so it's so light it's so sweet it's and with the more wheat that you put in there 45 freaking percent i mean i'm guessing that's just you know well and and my question is it going to be, be delicate i don't know when you have a a product like you said that no one has been you know going to the max with wheat um is that something and this kind of goes back to how you were talking about the experimentation it can take a long time when it comes off the still you've made a mash and then you've you've distilled it. Do you have a good idea of where that's going at that point, just from the the new make flavors that you're getting, or is it still kind of a gamble when you've not really seen something like this made before? Well, uh, I have to tell you true that uh, this was my introduction into using wheat in Mashville. So seven eight years ago, uh, I had never had never produced a Mashville at Lawrenceburg that had wheat in it. So, uh, but what I do know, and, and really my training is really was, uh, especially in the organolytic and century. Greg uh, said, screw it. I've never worked with wheat before. Go full send right now. 45%. Yeah. <laughs> but again, where I'm going with this is that, I know, I know if, if you produce a white distillate and a lot of my training or a majority of my training was really about evaluating white distillates before they went into the barrel to make sure that they were worthy of going into a barrel. So every time that I looked at a white distillate, I'm, I'm looking for quality defects that, that won't age out. Mm. Uh, now a, a barrel is always going to make good whiskey better but a barrel will not make bad whiskey good. Mm. And, and one of the key uh, parameters of my Seagram training was it was the, the uh, training that I got relative to uh, quality and sensory and organoleptic. And, you know, under the Seagram umbrella, if, if a whiskey did not make the quality uh, cut or the quality meet the quality parameters, uh, it, it, was uh, reconfigured into vodka it never went mm. into a barrel yeah. so uh I, something you know. so, something that i experienced on this whiskey journey that that you're talking about is it, very early on you know i thought white dog from every distiller you know basically tasted the same because it tasted oh, the no. same to me 
No. You know, because I'm not, I'm not in deep with the complexities of whiskey at this point. I'm fairly new. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. And, you know, I was, I had to have every whiskey with ice early on. Like I, you know, I, if I drank it straight, it was really hot for me, you know? And so it, it just kept progressing. Um, and so, yeah, so I didn't really have a, a palate for white dog, but we were at a distillery, um, last year and we were just getting a, a tour and they, um, they just pulled out some white dog that they were, they were doing right there. New make or whatever, just set it down in front of us and we tasted it. And we were like, what on God's green earth is this? This is so like, we could drink that and enjoy it as it was right then and there. And mm-hmm. so that's just something like, it, yeah. And the, and then I, and then I would taste Buffalo traces, you know, new make. And I'm like, Holy crap, these are very different. And so while I wouldn't have understood that five years ago, if you saying that be like, oh, okay, yeah, you can tell the difference is a new make, you know, or whatever. But now it's like, yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah. Y'all aren't just throwing uh, pasta at the wall. Um, you know, you already kind of know right off the still what you're doing and where you're going with it, I guess, no, no. leading back to Will's question. No, it's, it's absolutely true. Cause we, we probably had a dictionary of, uh, way over 50 different uh, types of defects that we'd be looking for. And I mean, there was, there's always maybe a top 10 that were the most common must mold, barnyard, uh, burnt, uh, hog pen, uh, you know, some are uh, aldehydes, some are grain related, some are fermentation related. uh, But like a sweet floral is what you'd be going for. Yeah, I mean, any, anything that, uh, that... That's what the new make we try. We were like, holy crap, like, how does this have so much character? But, yeah. It's really not even... I, I, I will say that I've never tried to produce to a certain descriptor, but uh, as long as you can make a product that that lacks any of those negative quality characteristics, uh, you've, you've got a winner. Uh, the minute you start introducing quality defects in a product into a barrel they're almost always going to carry through and it's always going to it's always going to taint the uh, outcome of what you've tried to do but uh, again i i have never tried and i maybe i'm not that good but uh, i can't i can't put a mash bill together and and say that i'm going to get this descriptor and that descriptor and i i i'm not that good but I, I do know that uh, if the product that I come up with of a custom mash bill like we've done, and it lacks all of the quality defects that we that I was trained to look for, I know at the end of the day that when that product comes out of the barrel, it's going to be a superior product. But mm. I, I, I couldn't tell you uh, four years in advance, uh, three years in advance, or six months in advance what the, what the century or the organolytic descriptors might be on that product. But I, I can, with a high degree of certainty, I can tell you that it's going to be a really nice product. Now, Speaking of a uh, couple of nice products, yeah, Will. We, uh, y'all were kind enough to send us uh, some of the Master's Blend series. Yeah. Little samples. So we've got the double wheat and the four grain. Which one should we pour up first? And we're going to ask you about them. Well, I would Which, do, by the uh, way, I've already pre-ordered both. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I would uh, I would look at them in the degree of uh, of uh, organoleptic. So the uh, double wheat, I think we would do first. That's going to be uh, the lighter uh, in flavor and lighter in organoleptic than than the four grain. So uh, yeah, I, I've got are you them. saying organoleptic? Yeah, yeah. So when when you, whenever you uh, look at a product like we're going to do tonight usually the first thing you do is is give it a really nice light sniff and that's that's the century part you're you're really trying introducing all those flavors to your nose and then when you actually taste it that's really the organoleptic part that you're really introducing it to your palate so it's it's a it's a two-phase uh uh proposition if you will and it takes both of them to really uh, enjoy the the entire product. 
So this is uh, the double wheat Masters Blend series, and it's 107.1 what? proof. Oh my gosh, the astringency on the nose is it is like an 80 proof. <laughs> yeah, not, not, it's not. Uh, it, it it very much has that, uh, and I'm guessing this has to do with uh, the the fine work of Mr. Metz. But the 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 power the nose rather is just very appetizing and and delicate it's yeah it soft, does not yeah, it's like it, you're the, not nosing something that's hitting you in the face with 107 proof it does it feels like the the weeded bird yeah i would i would think i was smelling the 92 proof from earlier 100 percent. all right i'm gonna dive in but tell us tell us a little bit about this double wheat well it's uh is really uh, uh a luxury uh of our custom core product mash bills and because our core product mash bills are extreme relative to everybody else, it really, and it wasn't, uh, it were, really wasn't necessarily designed this way it's six, eight years ago. But what I did find was that because our mash bills are extreme, I uh, actually had the latitude of creating blends that actually allowed me to create a mash bill within a mash bill. And, uh, and I did it with the, uh, the double wheat that you're enjoying right now. And I also was able to do it with the four grain. I still have the finish just lingering back. Mid yeah. I've, I've taken just a one a sip, skosh and it's just, it's with me. I, uh, and now this is the wheat whiskey and the wheat bourbon or the, the the weeded bourbon are the two components that went yes. into this, correct? Mm -hmm. I get yeah, I'm getting like, sweet tea. I get some like citrus in there as well. I get just all sorts of it's a flavor bomb. Yes, but it's, and it's still it's in so there. Soft. It's still in there. <laughs> like, like I, I have keep to drink back, more just to get rid of it. I keep thinking about the router, like you were saying. How instead of it being a uh, you know 107 proof bourbon, I think of other uh, 107 proof weeded bourbons. I'm not going to name names, but that there may be a squared corner when you drink that because it's 107 proof. It's you know six or seven years old, and it it's still needs some maturity to maybe round off in that corner but this itself Dude. is very uh rounded <laughs> yeah it's got curves Can well I say that about the whiskey sure absolutely <laughs> you know like when i when i say sometimes like man this is just really balanced it, it doesn't go one way or the other um but this this feels very balanced yeah with a freaking whatever this is three quarters of the way through i don't know what this it is, is yet but it just lingers it feels like sweet it feels like a warm sweet tea like you're having hot sweet tea that's what it feels like to me on my palate but it's so very uh, rich bill uh bill middleton wants to know how he can go about getting the double wheat a and as well the four grain these master blend series well, they uh, they will are or will be available in all fifty states, but they are going to be uh, limited runs. Uh, I think we're doing uh, at least initially we're we're doing like uh, twenty five hundred six pack cases of each each of those master series blends. So they they're not going to be out there in a large quantity, but we are distributed in all fifty mm -hmm. states. Yeah, so that's and about. I think 50 the, cases that's about 300 bottles of state if anybody wants to do that math <laughs> real quick yeah but we do have we we do have an old elk website that has a store locator and uh, that would probably be uh your first the first step in in trying to find out uh where yeah. what what stores close to you are going to carry old elk products and if you go to a store uh, and they don't have it on the shelf. I mean, you can certainly request that mm -hmm. the distributor uh, 
we, we are nationally aligned with Southern Glacier. So yeah, got, in Tennessee, they're able to order from the distributor right now, and that's yeah. what that's what I kind of jumped in on the other day to get one yeah. of each of these. What but I'm so glad I did. Is it is it also going to be? Is the Masters Blend series going to be an ongoing with this? Uh, these two, or are you going to change it up on a periodic basis? What Ooh, what kind of plans do you have good for the question, future, bro? Well, I, I expect that it's going to be both. I mean, uh, I'm, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Greg just said, "Hold my beer, boys." <laughs> yeah, you know, I hold my uh, four grain. <laughs> I'd like to uh, say that there's uh, probably a double rye coming in the future, but okay. you know, if if, uh, if these two products are well received, like we think they will, then I, I would certainly expect that uh, they'll uh, be available again next year on again a limited mm. basis. Now these are the the SRP on here is I think what 100 to 110, 15 somewhere in there. Am I right? I was thinking it was like ninety nine, but I haven't 99. seen. Price. Okay, a hundred. I haven't seen pricing sheets for a long time. Yeah, so. I guess depending on the state, I think uh, you're probably getting what you you requested through a distributor. Yeah, I'm you're getting in a hundred and ten a bottle, right? Which we have a little bit higher alcohol. Okay, here copy in that in Tennessee than what the SRP would be. But this now we're moving on to the four grain. So this is a hundred and five point nine proof, and yes, it is. Uh, this is going to be all four of the the standard mash bills, correct? Well, no, it's actually oh. a it's 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 a four grain, so it's it's a blend of Old Elk flagship bourbon and a blend of wheated bourbon. Got it. So it's got uh, corn, it's got rye, it's got malt, uh, and it's got wheat. What was the rye percentage on the the regular bourbon? Uh, the rye percentage on old up flagship bourbon is 15%. Okay. That's, okay. Right at that minimum, we have 34% malted barley and 51% corn. And, and I think that's where uh, I'm automatically getting the influences on this of the more malted barley. Like I yeah. get some, yeah. some of the cereal notes on the nose that um, obviously we're not as present in the double wheat that I'm getting on um, the four grain. So I, I, it's a unique, different, uh, a little bit of a pivot from where we were, I'd say. I've grown to like malted barley so much this past year. Yeah, you have to, you have put on your big boy pants. I have because in, yeah. in once I kind of got past, you know, the weirdness of it, you know, like, Oh my gosh, like this is well, definitely can, high. Let's tell Greg a story. Well, so, really quick. Let me finish. And then we'll circle back to the story. Um, but now, you know, all I'm really getting from it is just cherries and fruit. Like it's just really, really nice. So I have, you know, I have grown up a little bit, but then, then Will's got this story. That's just going to explain a lot. Well, Grease for the longest time would always say, I don't like malt that tastes malty, all this. But really what it was is it was when he would have, um, typically a, a not, well produced younger bourbon and so what he was just tasting was a lot of raw corn not necessarily well not a lot of barrel influence <laughs> and not a not a great whiskey now these are not things that we drink on the regular um but he would pour it and be like, malt 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 and i'm like oh it's malt i'm like i'm pretty sure you don't know what malt is yeah he kept saying that i'm like the <laughs> hell i don't will I'm like so, i know uh, what it tastes like it tastes like this so when he's saying he's he's grown to appreciate malted barley more this year it just means that he's actually tried things that have higher percentages of malted well barley and, and the way he came to, this to the five percent uh you know 36 month whiskey that he was thinking was malted barley influence yeah well it, it it all came to a head when you we were at a party at, at Chase's and you were like, Grease, taste this. And I go, Oh no, it's malty. And you're like, No, it's just a year old or six yeah, months yeah, old. There was zero malted barley in it at all. <laughs> yeah. And, and he and he literally told the guys, I'm like, hey, watch this. Yeah, and I'm so I was an idiot. So but that's we how did, we discovered that. Hey, but we did figure it out. You know, I thought chocolate was vanilla for a second. <laughs> But I've I've come speaking I've come, of chocolate, I've come to know the Lord. I do, I do get a a finish of kind of a chocolatey toffee kind of finish on this that is quite good. No, there's a lot of dynamics in there, and mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a really nice uh, blend of four different grains. Uh, yeah, it's spicier. Well, I like I, that, and I think what I 
even though this is the 105 proof, you mm. don't get like an aggressive Kentucky hug, uh, you know, even though not Kentucky in this case, but the, the, the Kentucky hug that, you know, that little bit of lingering burn, it's just so, uh, the flavors are so dynamic and in the finish, like you said, you can take a sip and I'm just sitting here still chewing on it, salivating on it, but it's not distracted by some sort of alcohol burn in the chest, even though, it is a lot more concentrated flavor and and more alcohol percentage. So, mm-hmm. I'm I'm very impressed with the 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 drinking experience of these two are just in and of themselves completely different than a lot of of whiskeys All out right, there. Greg, the I know you don't have a favorite or you know a least favorite or whatever, but for my listeners, our listeners, the four grain is good, but the I went back to the double wheat and it is it's. <laughs> The four grain is really good, Greg. The double wheat is stupid. It's kind of it's kind of life changing. And if <laughs> you take this away out of the lineup, I'm gonna be upset, Greg. <laughs> I know, I know where Colorado is, Greg. It's squarish. Well, that's the that's the endorsement we're looking for, brother. That's awesome. Well, it's it's stupid. Yeah. Is what it is. It was good on the front end, but we had just had a weeded. Yeah, right, right. We had had the weeded bourbon before that. So Going they complemented each other. And well. it was already killer. Yeah. we go. I go to the four grain, and I'm like, man, this is good. It's spicier. Let me go back see, to the other one there's to see how it compares. Like, and I go back, and I'm like, Jesus. So I think that's where it's a lot different, too, is that the, the double wheat does have a lot of the sweetness and the savoriness that I get from the four grain is, is just a fantastic treat as well, because it's, I mean, they they really are kind of fun to do side by side. So I think everyone should pick up one of each. Uh, so you can do this experience of having them side by side where you've got the sweet here, but then you introduce the rye in the, in yes. the four grain. And so you're getting a lot more savory notes that, that kind of punch through. Yeah, are we, are we completely off base, Greg? Not at all. No, it's uh, and that's really uh, the whole reason behind the concept of both of them is it, it gives you a, an opportunity to compare uh, two different mash bills, really, and and get a chance to you know see what the different grains bring to the table. There's two uh, things I want to say about these: is I've tasted a bunch of old elk. You can tell that these are special. So I like that they're like the master series or whatever, and they are completely appropriately priced at a hundred dollars. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like you're, you're honestly like with a special release like this, I mean, I, I would have thought it would be higher than that. So, well, and I think that is a testament to old elk as well, because every price point for every product of theirs that I've, encounter oh I bet yeah when you drink it it's like nailed it <laughs> you know like it's that's what you're looking for so yeah. um this has been and we don't blast. have to say this nice stuff greg we could have already ended it oh yeah 100 100 we're being we're not we're not tooting your whole although i think you're a very nice human being and you're badass um you know i i don't necessarily have to talk this much about your whiskey being killer it speaks for itself well, it's well, making I, me I'm, I'm thrilled to death that I haven't been muted a long time ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not muted. I'm coming to Colorado, though. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Greg, those, you know, those cheeks look kissable, Greg. Okay. Well, oh, Gre- Grease is getting served with his fifth <laughs> restraining order from a master distiller <laughs> in uh, just a matter of a couple hours. Harlan so. Wheatley, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sending us these samples that are going to go home with me um, this evening. And I mean, you said you already ordered some, so I did. did. I I did. Hey, thanks for giving me the the hookup on where to order those. I appreciate you. I didn't know that you had a bat channel like that, but that's (sighs) cool. Well, um, everyone, it go to. uh, You've already told me to add you, add you to, add me to your life three hundred and sixty, so you can track me that way. Figure it out. Yeah, I deleted it. I'd rather not. Uh, Everyone go (laughs) to your local liquor store and and pick up some old elk. Uh, I mean, I've 
love the weeded bourbon. I'm Walk in fan. there and say, I don't want Blanton's. I don't want Pappy. I want you to special order me 10 double wheats and two four grains of yeah. Old Elk Master. Fight series. for them because these are, these are fantastic. You're going to love them. Um, also, uh, we have been in talks about doing an Old Elk single barrel pick for oh, yeah. Oak, Oak and Thieves. Wait, we can do that? Yeah, yeah we've been talking with Shem about it. Well, dadgummit, it's yeah. in Colorado, and we have another barrel to pick in Colorado. So uh, so folks that are a part of Oak and Thieves, oakandthieves.com, uh, we are going to be picking uh, an Old Elk barrel very soon. And Greg, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blast and a, a good time getting to know you a little bit. Absolutely. My pleasure. I love hanging out with you guys and just getting a chance to talk whiskey. It's fun. Man, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, Drinking With is such a fun series. I'm glad we brought it back and brought it back in style with Mr. Greg Metz of freaking Old Elk. We don't know Jack, but we'll drink it.